the strongest radio allowable by law. Secrets will be revealed. Myths dispelled. From the studio gym where excuses never apply. It's Superhuman Radio with your host, Carl Lenore. Hey, hey. Welcome back to another episode of Superhuman Radio. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the death of bodybuilders. A lot of us have been asking ourselves this question. Uh, are bodybuilders dying at a higher rate than the general population? What is going on here? We're going to explore a recent study that looked at the uh, autopsies of uh, young di- of bodybuilders. I, I, I think they were below the age of 50, which is young. I'm 64. Um, and what we can attribute uh, the risk of death in the bodybuilding community to. Uh, if you notice, uh, we have a uh, new camera, new lighting. We have everything that's new. I really didn't want to invest in all of this because I'm going to be off the air in 2024. And I felt, why should I invest in a, a brand new uh, studio equipment? But I had to. I had no choice. The old server crashed and the old camera sucked. And now you have a better view of me, too, right? Before it was just my head, you could see. Uh, so there you go. Uh, before we get started, we have to thank our title sponsor, and that is Legendary Foods, uh, makers of the tasty pastry, but more importantly, makers of the sweet rolls. If you miss or if you never even indulge in uh, a Cinnabon because of its uh, macros and the amount of sugar in them, uh, you can now experience it without any of the guilt. Uh, Ron Penna and his team over at Legendary Foods came up with uh, a cinnamon, a chocolate, and a wild berry version of the Cinnabon. And it tastes every bit as decadent. You will think you're eating crap. You'll go back and read the uh, ingredient list over and over again. Uh, But it has uh, one gram of sugar, five grams of net carbs, and 20 grams of high quality dairy protein, but you'll swear you're eating crap. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash legendary and use the code SHR10 to save 10% off and buy plenty. If you have young children in the house, make them eat these instead of the crap that all their friends are eating uh, and you will be better served as a parent. Uh, Now, without further delay, let me, boy, it's been so long since I've done a live show. I've almost forgot what to do. At least I have a computer that works now let's see what we have here hello dr escalante how are you hi carl i'm doing great thank you so much for having me i keep expecting something to fail the past two weeks i've been plagued with boogeymen in my computers until they finally failed so i'm apprehensive i'm like is he gonna talk (laughs) it's good to have you good to have you what made you interested in the uh the the recent uh, deaths of bodybuilders well, you know, for, for many years, uh, I've been uh, a bodybuilder myself. I've worked in many capacities as, a, as an athlete competitor, as a, as a coach, as a judge. Uh, and between 2012 and 2019, specifically, I worked as an athletic, training, as an athletic trainer providing uh, first aid, uh, emergency response services, uh, sports medicine services to uh, shows in Southern California via muscle contest. So I worked basically everything in San Diego, Orange County, LA County, all the way up to Las Vegas uh, in, in the Nevada area, uh, all the shows. Um, obviously within that, I, I uh, was able to deal with a lot of things. Luckily, I didn't have any deaths that occur on, on my clock, but I did have 
you know, cramping, uh, you know, severe dehydration, et cetera. And then along this, uh, you know, just, I just got so tired of seeing uh, people. Uh, it's like another, another, there's another bodybuilder. And all you hear is like, rest in peace, bro. Rest in peace, bro. Rest in peace, bro. Um, you know, and uh, it, I'm like, it, it just became a, a constant thing that, you know, it was like, if it was not once a year, it was every few months. And then specifically between, um, gosh, I'm going to say 2012, 13, 14, we see some of these come in, but, uh, you know, we had some big deaths with, uh, uh, gosh, just in the last few years, uh, occur that, that were kind of back to back to back. Dallas, Dallas McCarver. Um, who was the guy they called the juggernaut? Um, I think he was from Australia or Britain originally. He, he worked with uh, the folks at Redcon. I can't think of his name. Uh, Luke, Luke Sandow. Yeah, Luke. Yeah, Luke, Luke uh, Sandow, yeah. And there, this was depression-related, right? I mean, he committed suicide, so. Well, you know, that one's, that's that's what, uh, there's a little controversy in that because the family said, you know, heart thing, and then ever, some other people and so, so some of his close friends did say suicide. Um, but, I mean, nonetheless, you know, they're, they're, they're occurring for one reason or another. These are young individuals. Uh, and, and it is very interesting. And then, of course, you know, we have the Sean Rodens. Uh, we have the, you know, so, some some big names that that have occurred. Uh, we have some women that have passed away. So we're talking about just the men, but there are some some women internationally. Uh, just recently, a bodybuilder died at age 46 who was an IFBB Pro 212 bodybuilder. Um, I, that was just literally about one or two weeks ago uh, that it happened. I don't recall the gentleman's name, but it did catch my my attention. So I just saw these kind of mounting up uh, again and again. Uh, I, I knew a lot of these guys personally. So uh, I had the opportunity to work with Dallas McCarver, with Luke Sandow, um, providing backstage services uh, again when they were competing at the Cal Pro at different times. Um, and um, I, I knew Daniel Alexander, who was another IFBB pro, died at age 30. Uh, so I knew some of these guys, you know, at, uh, you know personally. Uh, some better than others, but but uh, it just it just killed me to see that that uh, these were happening, you know, again and again. And and there's some things that we don't, we don't even hear of, you know, like there was a woman that died uh, before the USA Championships uh, about maybe four or five years ago. Uh, she she didn't even make it to the weigh in. She didn't make it to the registration. Uh, she literally died in her hotel room, which was not even she wasn't staying at the host hotel. But it happened as she was getting ready for a competition. So we, we got a young woman in her 30s. Her husband was there, left two kids behind. Uh, you know, it just breaks her heart to hear some of these right, stories. Right, right. Okay, so I got I, I got to ask the question everyone's asking. It's not about vaccines. We're going to talk about vaccines in a second. But as a whole, as a population, as a substratified population of the United States, I have to believe bodybuilders die less frequently than the general population of these same conditions. Well, you know, there was actually a, a, an interesting study. This was not a peer-reviewed paper, but there there is actually a, a paper that discusses, uh, and they actually did an analysis of uh, different. And there's actually two papers. One's peer-reviewed, one's non-peer-reviewed. Uh, the the peer-reviewed one actually looks at uh, they look at over two thousand or maybe fifteen hundred bodybuilders going back, and they actually look at you know what's the average age of some of these individuals compared to others that are that are not. Uh, in the bodybuilding category, and this but is other, sport, from, other sports or just general pe population. This is general people, general okay. people. Yeah. So uh, they were, they were, and and you actually see that they, you know, they are indeed, you know, uh, dying younger. You know, when 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 you put the stratification, the earmark of I'm, I'm a pro bodybuilder. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so we're we're talking, you know. Uh, 10 years or so uh, earlier than, than some of the others. So, I, well, they, they should have also been compared to other athletes uh, too. Because, yes, you know, that, that is a, that, that's a, that's a, a cohort, a different cohort entirely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and I see some of this, uh, we actually uh, were talking about this uh, not too long ago is, you know, uh, clearly people in uh, elite sports, you know, it drug use is, is not, not, specific to bodybuilding right, we, right. We, we're going to see it and we see it in, in endurance athletes uh you know we maybe even see it in pro sports you know maybe to a different level difference is is you know how much drugs are they using some are drug tested so they have to navigate around those you know they have to maybe some take of those drug tests are bs they're looking for the testosterone epitestosterone ratio so what these guys have started doing the ones that employ you know uh personal advisors is they're using epitestosterone alongside testosterone 
they're just looking for the ratio. They're not, and, and for instance, I heard from a good friend of mine who played, played pro ball for most of his life that in an NFL, they will allow total testosterone ranges up to 4,000. That is not physiological testosterone. Oh, no. <laughs> they're like, if it goes over that, we're going we're gonna to look at you. It's like, wait a minute. If it goes over 2,500, you should be looking at them, you know. If, yeah, if it goes, if, yeah, if it goes significantly over fifteen hundred, they should be looking. Yeah, at yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I give them the benefit of the doubt. Twenty five hundred. These guys are they're, they're they're genetically different. They maybe they have higher testosterone levels, but come on, four thousand. I mean, that that four thousand is five hundred milligrams uh, to to depending on your age, because older men conserve testosterone better uh, through a reduction of testosterone receptors in the liver, which is part of evolution, I'm sure. But I mean. 4,000, that's at least 750 milligrams of testosterone a week, at least. Yeah, you're my- doing high dosages for, yeah. for that, for sure. Yeah, and, and, and I agree with you. You know, the, these drug tests, you know, uh, to an extent, they're, they're kind of, a, I'm going to say, a, a facade for the public, to, for people to say, hey, yeah, we do drug tests. But at the same token, you know, and people kind of, they want to see the home runs hit. They want to see the big, they want to yeah. see bigger classes yeah. stronger. But yeah, they don't. Sometimes they don't want to see what it kind of takes to get there. right, and that's the silliness of it. Like we ought to just go, okay. Look, like if I can go and have radial keratotomy done so that I can achieve 2015 vision because I'm a golfer, Tiger Woods, or if I can have a a a, a ligament and a tendon rerouted, a hole drilled through the elbow and rerouted so I can pitch longer. Who are we BS in here? Sticking a needle in your ass all of a sudden is the is the, oh that's it we draw the line like we can anatomically surgically alter your physiology but don't you stick a needle in your ass it's like it's just so disingenuous in my opinion yeah it's and, and that's kind of a whole nother you know conversation yeah, with I the know. ethics and all of that and and with with bodybuilding you know it's kind of the same thing obviously the the IFBB uh, you know it's a it's a one of those where don't ask don't tell you know so obviously there's no testing. Um, and they, you know, uh, to their credit, I mean, they, at least they don't, they don't say we're going to do these Mickey mouse tests. Like you're saying, right, it's like, they're just not right. going to ask you about it. Right, um, right. But the, I think the one thing that is unique in bodybuilding is that the dosages required and the length of time required to do it is significantly more than, you know, these other sports. Yes. Because, and, because and, our, and, and, and I will also say this, and let's be honest. Most pro bodybuilders, I'm saying most because there's a guy out there going to say, well, I don't. Most pro bodybuilders are also recreational drug abusers. I mean, we've seen Rich Piana died because of his cocaine addiction, not because of his anabolic steroid use, but his anabolic steroid use definitely changed the landscape of his heart. So a lot of these bodybuilders using other stuff, too. And you can't tease that out easily. You know, yeah, there are there are a lot of covariates when you look at the the population and. Uh, and, and, you know, and there, and of course, genetics definitely play a role. I always say, you know, uh, Hey, what individual can, can benefit from, you know, 300 milligrams a week and they can get the same result on that as somebody taking a thousand milligrams. A yes, week. yes. And yes. vice versa, somebody can get adverse effect side effects taking yes. 300 milligrams a week. And the same, another person may be able to take 1500 milligrams a week and not have any deleterious effects or In significantly. Fact, I, I often said that one of the prerequisites to be a pro bodybuilder is to be able to do these drugs and not feel horrible from them. You know, um, I mean, I, I, I've, I've spoken openly about my drug use and it could be considered abuse on this show. I didn't get any, I didn't get horrible symptoms from anything. My, my estrogen levels didn't go crazy. I never developed really bad gyno. I didn't feel horrible on Trenbolone. I slept pretty good on trend. You know, so that's a prerequisite. Like, to be a pro bodybuilder today, you don't just have to have the genetics. You don't have to have just have the discipline. Uh, you don't just have to have the, the, the strength because some people can develop strength easier than others, but you have the, have the ability not to feel shitty on all these drugs. Yeah. Yeah. To, it, and then wear and tear on the body, right? Cause a lot of people get injured in the, in the process of training years in and years out. And you, you know, how much can you redline your body in all ways, uh, yeah. shapes and forms, because that is a unique component, especially if you're going to be in the game for any significant period of time. So let's talk about the study. Uh, how was this study designed? Yeah. So this was, 
obviously uh, uh, an observational study. What, what we did is uh, we, we did a general search in uh, dead bodybuilders. We actually just went on Dr. Google and uh, we did a search of uh, how, how many bodybuilders have died. And we actually were able to access about 18 different websites just in the first couple of pages. And we basically filtered down that information, uh, take, took away duplicates, et cetera. And then we basically said, how many of these uh, references actually report uh, people that were bodybuilders that died before the age of 50, um, really for any reason at that point in time? Um, and then we started narrowing down uh, a little bit further, right? So we looked at specifically how many of them died from heart disease uh, or heart related type illness, or maybe an unknown because we, an unknown, maybe they didn't know yet uh, when they reported it, but maybe they did the autopsy and they found out later. Uh, and uh, we were able to also look at, because we're going to look at autopsy reports, obviously it's not very feasible to do an autop get an autopsy report from somebody in Spain or in Australia. So right. they had to live in, in the United States and we had to have uh, a place of death because you need to identify that to call the coroner's office to be able to obtain the, the bodybuilder. So after we filtered all of those things, and we focus on males, we didn't do females uh, in, in this study. Um, we went ahead and uh, we were able to actually identify 14 individuals out of the 45 that had kind of met the initial criteria. 14 of them were that died in the United States, were under the age of 50, died of either cardiovascular disease uh, or cardiovascular related event. Um, and uh, we had a place of death uh, for those particular individuals. Uh, and then we had a list of those. And then we actually started uh, uh, working on the coroner reports. So we actually were able to track down uh, the coroner reports that were available. Unfortunately, not all of them were available. Uh, some were, you know, either, uh, for example, uh, not not publicly available to individuals for whatever reason. Uh, so maybe the family didn't want to disclose it uh, Etc. So we were able to actually get seven autopsy reports uh, of the 14. One of them, though, when we actually read it, because again, unknown causes were in there, um, it was actually a suicide. So we we took that out of the study. We didn't want we, we it's not that it's not important, but it was not specific. We were looking at cardiovascular related events. Right, right. Um, so that brought us down to six, a total of six. Now, since that time, of course, there's been other individuals that have died. So Boston Lloyd died shortly after we ran the initial study. And I know why Boston Lloyd died, because he I counseled him after he damaged his kidneys. You did. OK. Oh, yeah. He, he what he did was he took a peptide um, that is known to make you lose weight, but it's ex very harsh on the kidneys. And he took ridiculous doses because if some works, more is better. And he ri literally put himself right into stage two. A real oh, yeah, it was so devastating to hear. And, and I think he I think his his uh, aorta ruptured, if, if I remembered uh, that that was his cause of death, though. Right. OK. Yeah. I mean, it may have. I mean, after that, he was trying all sorts of stuff to save his own life. Uh, but the damage, uh, the, the damage to his kidneys was beyond repair. And yeah, I, I know he had bad kidney damage. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that's really what that's what put him in the hospital. The kidney damage put him in the hospital. And I'm sure he had. Other, and see, this is. This is my frustration. So Richard Miller, who's a big fan of the show, asked, what about Doug Brignoli? And I'm sure you're aware of Doug, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. So Doug, Doug is actually a, a friend of the show. He had appeared on the show numerous times. We talked about his arteriosclerotic plaque. It wasn't horrible, but he had some. So um, I recently had a CAC score of one. I have like two little specks, like two millimeters round specks of calcium uh, in, in, in my uh, in my aorta. And I was told that I have arteriosclerosis. And so the, my problem with the medical orthodoxy is they'll look at these guys trying to discover why they died. And they list all this stuff that is actually fairly unremarkable. Like they'll say arteriosclerosis was present. Well, what what degree of stenosis did we have? Was it an eighty percent blockage, or was it like negative less than a one percent blockage? Because that makes a difference, especially if 
You have a high thrombotic index. Uh, I can't not say this, but there is some suspicion that these vaccines are making people's blood thick. They're causing clotting. You know, if you have a, if you have a stenosis of 50 percent, you could live your entire life of no, and never know that until maybe one night something you did, your, 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 your viscosity of your blood changes and now it can't get through that little that little hole anymore. Now, what really killed you? Was it the arteriosclerotic plaque or was the transient uh, effects of, of uh, uh, hem- hemodynamics? So part of the problem I have with this listing people with arteriosclerosis, it's like saying you have a bunion. It may not hurt you, but some people have to have surgery for it. What degree of arteriosclerosis are we seeing? Are we seeing a complete blockage of a major artery? Or are we just seeing some buildup of plaque that's non-consequential? They never tell you that. They don't. They just say uh, arteriosclerosis is present. Yeah, and that was interesting in in uh, in some of these autopsies. So, um, to one of the criticisms we had in reading the autopsy reports, and we actually did discuss this in the study, is uh, we the autopsy reports are kind of all over the place. Some were actually quite thorough. They did full toxicology reports and. We, we could actually read a lot more into what occurred. Some were done quite vaguely. Uh, so uh, we actually found another paper that actually discusses this among coroners. So this is, you know, coroners reading uh, coroner peer-reviewed literature. And they're basically saying, hey, you need to try to identify individuals who may be uh, candidates of abusing uh, anabolic steroids and so somebody who has extreme, extreme large muscle mass, relatively low body fat, uh, maybe you find in the police report that there were certain drugs that, that are anabolic steroids in the house. Okay, so now dig a little further, do a little more testing, so that way we can kind of have a better picture. Because some of them were vague, and some of them did actually report, um, you know, like you, like you said, it is important, and atherosclerosis is present, but how much? So in, in, our, in our list, we actually had a about 50% blockage in most uh, or more. Uh, so we we do see that. And then, of course, as you say, it's not one thing that's going to necessarily, you know, get you, right? It's always multifactorial. So, you know, having your HDL low and your LDL high, that itself is not going to kill you. Uh, right. But, uh, you know, having your, your hematocrit high, that itself is not going to kill you. But putting all of these things together, Right, and this years and years and years, right? Yeah. This is what's going to potentially lead to the problem outcome, which 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 is at the very uh, most extreme scenario, it's death, right? Uh, right. So, and and that's kind of where we have to to look at it. And you have you have some great points, absolutely. I mean, uh, we know though, for example, testosterone is going to increase hematocrit levels. You know, and and to what extent? That's going to vary from individual to individual. Maybe you, your starting hematocrit level is relatively low and you take testosterone and it goes up, you know, 10 points, 15 points. And it's high, but it's not extremely high. But if you're already on the high end of normal and now it goes up 10 or 15 points, now you're in danger. We have one one risk factor in there. Right. Uh, I agree. So those are those are the the multifactorial things. And then, of course, you have to look at the other components that occur, uh, you know, besides the atherosclerosis. So we have left ventricular hypertrophy. Right. Uh, you know, we, we have we have those types of things. So uh, the myocardium thickness. So we see a lot of that. So, I mean, 100 percent of the the individuals that were autopsied had left ventricular hypertrophy. In fact, the the left ventricle myocardium thickness was about 125 percent bigger than the reference mean. But, but OK, now here's another thing. So there's pathology and there's physiology. So as a weightlifter. We know that there are physiological changes because of chronic valsalva. The heart becomes a better pump. Now, if you show this to the actual average doctor, he goes, oh, you've got an enlarged heart. But what matters is the thickness of the wall and the thickness of the sinus. So if you have a thickening of the wall and the sinus is getting smaller, that's pathology. But if you have a thickening of the wall and the sinus is getting bigger, that's physiological changes to adapt to the, the, to the work that you're giving the heart. The heart's getting stronger. It's, it's preparing. It's saying, oh, shit, this guy's going to hurt me if I don't get bigger and stronger. And we've seen this in studies with 
weightlifters without drugs and weightlifters mm -hmm. with drugs. Some of the early studies done on, I want to say the Russians, showed that you take an average guy and you run him through a, a year of real training, resistance training, building strength, building muscle, his heart gets bigger, but it's physiological change. It's not, path, not pathology. It's actually improving. So can, can the av average guy who's dissecting a, a bodybuilder go, oh, yeah, his heart is large? Are they measure, measuring the sinus size along with the, with the wall thickness and saying, well, this isn't, this isn't a pathology. This guy just had a really big, strong heart. Yeah, well, it, you, you, you make some very good points. And, and there are, the, you know, one of the limitations we mentioned in our study, we compare it to the reference man, which mm -hmm. obviously the reference man is the reference man. That's not, and we actually mentioned specifically what you state. It is known that, you know, if you compare uh, resistance trained men that have never used a drug and resistance trained men that have used a drug, both of them have, uh, you know, left ventricular hypertrophy. Both of them are going to have enlarged hearts. Uh, and there was actually a recent study that just came out uh, looking specifically at that question. And uh, they're actually, of course, these are living individuals, so you, you can't measure everything uh, as we could in an autopsy, right? But they're, actually, <laughs> yeah, but they're doing things, for example, they're looking at ejection fraction, uh, right. right? So this is, this is an important component because that can lead to pathology. So they were looking at um, the usually the left ventricle and, and the the uh, is actually significantly thicker in those that are using drugs versus right. those that are not. And ejection fraction, interestingly enough, is actually worse in the people that have been using the anabolic right. steroids. So, so we do see on average, even though they, we, you're right, they both grow, but the extent and the, and the changes are a little bit different, even between resistance trained men that have never used a drug and resistance trained men that have, because obviously we have to remember the heart's a muscle too. So it, it's, if, if it, so your, your heart's on steroids in a sense as well. Right. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> so. And, then, and, then, and then the other thing is that I have a large portion of my audience that are on HRT, including me. I am really on HRT. Now I'm on the lowest dose of testosterone I've been on in over 25 years. I'm taking 250 milligrams a week and I'm not playing around with any other, compounds anymore and i'm really i'm an old guy i re, I've, I've, I've accepted the mantle and i'm not going to trash my body what about us we're, we're using anabolic steroids the, the, the public forgets testosterone in women is an anabolic steroid what, what about us do we have to worry about uh, the, the thickening of the heart the changes of the morphological changes of the heart from these steroids yeah and that's that's a great question and i think uh you know you have to put it into context as well right so you know, uh, HRT, I mean, you're on the high end of what, what would be considered an HRT dose, you know, 200 to 250 is definitely the high end of what most doctors would, would medically prescribe. Uh, average prescription is, you know, as little as maybe 50 milligrams, maybe to hundred milligrams, but depending on your needs, obviously you're working with a physician and looking at your levels and they're measuring all of these things. And that's why it's important, um, to understand, because I, I think sometimes people, Young individuals, I think, so they say, oh, I'm just on HRT. And to them, I, I, HRT I, means they're on 600 milligrams, milligrams a week. 500 milligrams a week of test and 250 milligrams a, piece, a week of equipoise. No, that's not HRT. Yeah, and that's not HRT. Yeah, HRT is, first of all, it's medically supervised, medically prescribed. And that means that your physician or healthcare provider is doing regular blood work to look at your testosterone levels, making sure that they're on the on the high end of normal not not above that right and then there's no pathology occurring along the same time so your hematocrit level is in check your hdl is in check your ldl is in check you said you measured you had a coronary uh uh coronary score that was done so they're they're keeping track of all of these biomarkers making sure that you don't have high blood pressure so all of these things are need to be monitored on a regular basis uh for it to be legitimate uh hrt uh, working with that with that healthcare provider. So to your question, I think the problem comes when you kind of cross over that threshold. And uh, when you go, when now your testosterone levels, like we talked about just a, a while ago, if your testosterone levels are 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, for the short term, you're going to probably be able to recover. But what happens when you're when you're doing that for six months, one year, two years, 15 years, 20 years? And that's where we see the pathology really occurring because it's dose dependent and length of exposure dependent. So mm -hmm. if you have high dosage and high length of exposure over time, 
now all of these things are going to really uh, come together. Right. And I always say, you're going to look great on the outside. You're going to be ripped. You're going to be muscular, uh, but you may be rotting on the inside. Right. And, and you have to look at those biomarkers. And there are ways to do it. You know, you can you can uh, minimize the risks, uh, even if you're being relatively aggressive without being super crazy uh, right. to monitor your health. And there's one other thing that people should understand. Testosterone is good for the heart until it's not. And what I mean by that is if you're using high doses of testosterone and you do have an, a cardiac ischemic event, it will make the outcome worse because the heart continues to pump as hard as it can, even though it's starving for oxygen. So you end up with a lot more necrotic tissue. You end up with a lot more collateral damage to the heart. So high doses of testosterone in the incident of a, a, a heart attack happening will make it worse for you to recover. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it, that. yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's quite interesting uh, uh, to when you, when you kind of put it all together. And, and I think, you know, particularly with the, the younger individuals, you know, I mean, I think when, when you're 20, 25, 30, you, you, you don't often think that mm -hmm. it's going to happen to you. Uh, and you're probably, I mean, hopefully you are, uh, but you might not be as uh, prone to go to the doctor and get regular blood work and get regular mm -hmm. checkups because a lot of these things, you, you know, you don't feel your HDL levels being in the gutter. Mm -hmm. You don't feel your LDL being super elevated. You might not even feel that you have hypertension, right? But I've seen guys in my lab that come in when we when we were actually measuring, uh, we were doing body fat analysis, you know, questionnaires, and we're, we're looking at bodybuilders, you know. So I have a 28-year-old guy come in, and uh, we're going to do a DEXA scan. We're going to, we check the blood pressure. And then I, in the in the questionnaire, I see all the drugs that they're taking because they, they list them. Uh, and then- yeah, their blood pressure is like, you know, 160 over 110 and they're 28 years old. And I'm like, did you know you have high blood pressure? And there's no, I'm, I'm just nervous, man. Okay, well, lay down and relax. Um, yeah, but laying down and relaxing. So I, I have one of the worst cases of white coat syndrome that any physician has ever seen. I was 12 years old. And I'll never forget his name was Dr. Merriweather. Two things he said during this exam that stuck with me for the rest of my life. The first thing he said to my mother was, hmm, his heart occupies a much larger space in his chest than I would have anticipated. Now, I was, a, I was always a big kid. You know, 12 years old, I was six foot. Okay. But the other thing, when he was taking my blood pressure, it was going through the roof. And he said to my mother, I don't believe this is his blood pressure. Let me go back in it. So he engaged me in a discussion. He had a beautiful ornate office. He had this beautiful wristwatch. And I said, that's a nice watch. And he started talking to me about the watch and stealthily pumping the smigmographer. And he came back and he goes, oh, no, your blood pressure is fine. Once I stopped paying attention, I told him, I don't like the way that the pressure of the cuff. And I'm that way today. Do you know when I have to go to the doctor and my doctor knows because I check my blood pressure at home regularly. When I have to go to the doctor for anything and he's not my GP, I take 10 milligrams of propanolol and my blood pressure is perfect. <laughs> because I just freak out about blood pressure. And I know there's a lot of people who are listening going, yeah, I'm the same way. You know, <clears throat> we need a better way to check blood pressure. I did a show about this seven, eight years ago. The blood pressure cuff that we use today is de designed in the late 1880s. And they knew it wasn't good then because they said <clears throat> in the original uh, patent, it's, it's important for the, uh, the patient to have their arm exactly at the, the height of the heart. Five, five to 10 degrees down, you'll get a different reading. Five to 10 degrees up, you'll get another reading. And, uh, and also they admitted that there was limitations trying to test the pressure of a fluid inside a hose and squeezing the outside of the hose to determine that we don't do that with our cars. We have internal pressure. I am waiting for someone to come out with ultrasound and some other technologies where they can actually tell us what our blood pressure is without trying to clamp down on the hose. Cause you're look, you know, this, when you go, if they don't use that big cuff, you get a completely different reading. I, I have 19 inch upper arms. If I'm going to use that big, that little cuff, I, I may as well say, no, I got high blood pressure. Because oh, yeah, and hopefully hopefully your healthcare provider understands at least that part of uh, the, the testing that, you know, you have to have 
you know, if, if you're a bodybuilder, you're obese, you know, you, you need, you need, you need extra large cuffs. The, the, the average size cuff will automatically give you hypertension. Uh, yeah. because, and, because and, it's, and it's a lie. And then they want to give you a drug. But anyway, we, 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 let's do this. Let's take a break. And when we come back, let's get back on track. Uh, my friend Joel Green made a comment that I want to put up here, and we'll talk more about your research and what we can actually take away from it. We're talking sure. with Dr. Guillermo Escalante. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more Superhuman Radio. Merrick Health is a premium telehealth platform that connects customers with partnered providers from the comfort of your home. Merrick provides concierge service with your very own patient care provider as your health advocate. You'll go over all your needs and goals from improving sexual function, hair loss prevention, increased muscle, fat loss, and overall improved performance. Prescribed treatment options can be ordered and shipped directly to you if you meet the requirements. All from the comfort of your home. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash Merrick Health. That's M-A-R-E-K-H-E-A-L-T and order your comprehensives and get 10% off with code SHR. Don't forget to add the lab analysis to have results reviewed with potential over-the-counter supplements or treatment recommendations. That's shrnetwork.biz slash Merrick Health and use code SHR at checkout or order your own desired labs with code SHR and get 10% off your first lab order. I would easily say that I am the hugest proponent you will ever meet to doing anything that will improve the quality of my sleep. And that's because sleep is linked to just about every metabolic disorder we see in our population today. One of the easiest things you can do to improve the quality of your sleep is to get a pillow that can be shaped into the exact form factor that allows you to get your best night's sleep. And that is my pillow. I've been sleeping with my pillow for a few years now. And I can tell you that when I have to travel and stay in hotels, I don't get a good night's sleep because I don't have my pillow with me. Right now, you can save up to 60% off of everything offered to improve the quality of your sleep at shrnetwork.biz slash my pillow when you use the code SHR. Or you can call toll free 800 800- 889-4938 and remember to use code SHR to save up to 60% off of everything at their website. Remember those rectangular toaster pastries you used to love when you were a kid? Well, Legendary Foods has just made them better. The new cake style tasty pastry is like nothing you've ever had before. With 20 grams of high quality protein and less than one gram of sugar, you'll feel like you're cheating, but you're not. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash legendary and use the code SHR10 to save, to save 10% off your purchase of tasty pastries. Now now available in cookies and cream, red velvet cake, birthday cake, blueberry, strawberry, brown sugar cinnamon, and hot fudge sundae. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash legendary and use code SHR10 today. Did you know your body houses around 1 trillion bacteria cells? That's 50% of your body. After the holidays, you've eaten a lot of foods and drank a lot of things that you shouldn't have, and your microbiome can actually be disrupted. In fact, just two days of introducing new things to your stomach changes the diversity of your microbiome. Here's the new year, and it's time to straighten that out. If you notice you're suffering from bloating and gassiness after the holidays, it's time to start taking P3OM. P3OM is different because it uses a patented natural process to upgrade a well-researched probiotic strain that doubles every 20 minutes once inside your body. The patent proves this. And it's proteolytic, which means that it digests protein. It's antiviral. It's antiretroviral. It eliminates pathogens and waste and is maintainable in the human digestive system. It's time for you to give your body what it's been missing the past couple months. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash P3 hyphen OM and use the code SHR10 to save 10% off. Your gut will thank you. Millions of people know that shrewd food is the smartest way to snack. Ever get that craving for crunchy snacks, but don't want to eat all the those empty carbs? Well, instead of puffed corn or wheat, like most snacks, Shrewd Food puffs protein powder. This gives these crazy efficient macros. That's as high as 67% protein and with only 90 calories. So knock out the carbs, but keep the amazing flavor and crunch you're looking for. Shrewd Food is now available at Walmart and Sprouts. Or go to shrnetwork.biz slash shrewd food and use the code SHR25 for 25% off your order. This is the Superhuman Chat. Evolution just got kicked up a notch. I can't believe it. Everything is working great. <laughs> That's it. Got to keep it working great. Um, 
So this actually leads into one of the questions, and it's a, a comment from Chris K. Um, in regards to blood pressure, what do you guys recommend as more of a natural approach? I'm on TRT, and I, I always runs elevated. Well, before, before I, I want to connect some dots with you. <clears throat> bodybuilders like to use insulin nowadays. Lots of bodybuilders eat very, very high carbohydrates. Insulin levels predict blood pressure because of angiotensin, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme, which is produced in response to high insulin levels. Can we, can we have a discussion where people start looking at metabolic problems first before they say, well, how can I lower my blood pressure? Can, can we start talking about becoming metabolically flexible, cutting back on carbs, Maybe wearing a, 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 a CG, a, what are they, CGM, continuous glucose monitor. You know, most of us eat nine, the same nine foods day in and day out. G get a CGM and see what your insulin is really doing. Get your C-peptide and insulin, direct insulin tested. And, and learn about insulin first before you start to ask for magic beans to control blood pressure. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I think... You know, high blood pressure, you know, has, first of all, there's, there's a genetic predisposition to it, as, as we say, um, you know, uh, the, the, the raw system is going to, is going to control your blood pressure, whether it's going to be decrease or decrease. And, um, and, and when you intervene with some of these things, when you're on, on high dosages of, um, it may be even, it could just be TRT dose, uh, or it may be it's, you know, super physiological, it may actually have an impact on that raw system, which is then going to set up the cascade to potentially uh, elevate that blood pressure. Uh, so you have to kind of look multifactorial uh, at, at, at all of these things. And I think you have to kind of uh, start there. Um, I will say, you know, the, I mean, the, the traditional natural approach, you know, to, to answer this particular question is, you know, obviously you have to start with the diet, which is related to what Carl was saying, you know, so, you know, uh, what are you eating? And basically that, that DASH diet is something you can start to, to implement, which is basically, you know, lower in sodium, uh, is that going to have an impact? And of course, when you look at the individual studies, there are people who who respond uh, are high responders or non-responders to low sodium or high sodium diets. So you don't really know until you try it yourself when you have to identify some of those things. Um, if you are have higher body fat, that that's going to contribute to potentially uh, hypertension. If you're not doing any aerobic work, you should probably implement some aerobic work in there um, and then try to figure out, you know, what what the cause may be. But that being said, I, I'm always, um, I'm not afraid to, uh, if you're working with your physician to, uh, many years ago I was, you know, it's like, I, I didn't want to take, you know, no, I don't want to take a hypertension drug. I don't want to take this. I don't want to take that. Uh, and I just want to do it, you know, quote unquote, all natural. But if you're on TRT, you're already kind of opening the, the gate to there anyway, right? I mean, why are you on TRT? Yeah, what's because that? your testosterone levels are not, are not, so taking some of these as ancillary ancillary drugs are not always uh, a bad thing. And, and, you know, I'll speak personally for myself, you know, um, I went, I went to see a cardiologist a couple of years ago, uh, got some work done and uh, my blood pressure was kind of running on, on uh, not quite super high, but it was on, on the high end of normal. So we started taking Telmasartan and my, my Telmasartan. That's, that's, that's an ARB, right? It's an ARB, which controls I, guess I, what? I the raw system. I did a show about three years ago that bodybuilders should turn to ARBs because they they have less unwanted side effects. And the other thing is you don't want to reduce angiotensin converting enzyme as a, as a, a blanket for the whole body. You just want to give enough uh, ARBs to block some of the receptors, you know what I mean? Instead of just shutting it down. So I think ARBs are very sensitive and they don't seem to have the uh, unwanted side effects. Some guys, uh, from other blood pressure meds, they have erectile dysfunction. They, you know, if you're using beta blockers, they can make you depressed because they block the beta adrenergic system in the brain as well. ARBs seem pretty innocuous. You like them, huh? Yeah, and and that's the thing. That's why it's important for you not to play pharmacist and play doctor, or 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 talk to a coach that plays pharmacist or play doctor. Work with your medical provider. You know, so I went to see a cardiologist who specializes in this. Uh, they work in conjunction with you know, my, my, uh, my hormone replacement physician. Right. And, uh, and they're all, they're all in cahoots and they, and I, they work in conjunction with my primary care physician. So I have three medical providers, uh, 
kind of overseeing, you know, the goods under the hood, as I say. And uh, and then we 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 work together to to get the re best recipe. Uh, and then again, you have to titrate dosages and figure out what dosage is going to work well, so you don't have side effects and you have you have the desired outcome. So everything does stay in check. Uh, to the blood pressure conversation earlier, you're right. Sometimes if you're just checking when you go to the doctor, it's probably not ideal, uh, especially if you're using uh, anabolics, either in high dosages or even replacement dosages like you do. You should check it at home on a regular yeah. basis, you know, at least once a week or every couple of weeks, have a blood pressure cuff that fits at home and you, you and you can have regular measurements of, of those things. And but, I, uh, but I, will, I will say this, if you have white coat syndrome like me, there's still something that needs to be done about it because this is what it means. You know, um, well, I, I carry a gun, so I don't get into road rage. I don't get into arguments because I have a gun on me all the time. But with that being said, those of us who have the ability to get our blood pressure up that fast also blood pressure is just a symptom of what's going on. You're, you're, your fight or flight is kicking in. You may make stupid decisions. You really need to learn to keep that 100 miles an hour down to 50, and nothing works better than meditation. Uh, oh, yeah. If you meditate even once a day for 10 minutes, you'll start to see a change in your response to, like, when somebody's going to take your blood pressure. You have more control. You can breathe through it, and it's like, oh, yeah, your blood pressure is fine. So that's another thing. That's a, that's a, that's a, in my humble opinion, that's a it's a red flag. You need to, you, you because people who die suddenly of like heart attacks are the ones that, oh my, you know they they get they get to that hundred mile an hour place too fast, and boom. Yeah, I think all those things definitely play a part. Uh, uh, some other natural ways to kind of answer that question is like, are you sleeping enough? Right? Are you sleeping? What's the kind of the amount of stress that you have sleep. in your life? And meditation can actually uh, be a, a another strategy that can be implemented to help control some of these things. So, you know, you definitely want to try all of these before you maybe start the medication. Uh, but uh, this is why you work with your healthcare provider to kind of figure out what's working and what's not. Uh, Joel Green makes a good point. He said, let's not leave out professional wrestlers. Interestingly, the boys from Robbinsdale, who most likely all had the same supplier, in other words, on gear, died young. Rick Rude, Kurt Henning, Hawk, Animal, you know, so many of us buy, uh, buy or have bought drugs from underground labs, and you'd be surprised to find out that some of these underground labs are in people's kitchen, you know, and, and just because the label looks good, and they have a holographic uh, tag on the bottle, you're like, oh, this stuff is legit. It, it, it's dangerous. We don't know how much lead or heavy metals are in those powders that they're buying. They're probably not testing if they're an underground lab. They're not sending mass spec samples out because they don't want anybody to know that they're working with these these compounds. There's a, there's a, there's a high contaminant. I remember Dr. De Pasquale came on my show. He, he was on my show the first time in, in late 2005. But one of the shows we did, he talked about how they bought steroids from all different sources and what they found in some of them was horrible. In fact, they found mold in the rubber stoppers that are supposed to be, you know, uh, sterile. They had oh, mold scary. on the inside of the rubber stoppers. He said, That's you know, th th somebody injects this. Th there's, there's that abscess for sure. So yeah, you, that's you're scary. Really, you're really and, taking your life in your own hand when you buy gear on the street, you know? Yeah. And, and today, you know, today, because of there, there's so much more regulation and all of that here, particularly in the United States. You know, uh, really, if you're a bodybuilder and you're trying to do this, I mean, you're almost left with you have no choice uh, except to, to get it that way. So, yeah, you you're really have to uh, be careful with what you're getting and, and, and uh, how you're getting. Because, again, it's very easy to, to spend an extra four or five dollars and get a really nice label done and, you know, yeah. get a nice bottle done. Packaging is not nothing. You know, that's not the expensive part. But how is it produced? And. Like you said, what's the purity of the compounds and, and all those other items? That's what's really important. Co co compounding pharmacies where they blend their own testosterone, their own injectables, have to achieve such a higher level of standard um, by the Food and Drug Administration. They have to have rooms that have zero particles of anything in the air. You know, like the, like the movies where they walk in, 
to the, the vestibule and it sprays them down and it sucks the air out. And then they put their hazmat suits on and they walk it. That's exactly what they do in some of these pharmacists. And then meanwhile, your buddy is, is bringing it to 400 degrees in his oven, the oven that he just cleaned with the, with the, some chemical to get the, and those fumes are in there and they're, they're going into the juice and you're shooting it. I mean, it's really, if you don't know where you're getting this stuff, you need to change your approach. You really, really do. Because, I, you know, it's funny. You said when you're young, you don't think about death. But once you get past 60, all you think about is death. So <laughs> I, I kind of turned the corner where all of a sudden I'm like, I'm just not willing to shit on my body anymore. You know, I, I want to finish the race. So, yeah, I wanna, absolutely. I, I want to take one last commercial break. When we come back, I, I have to ask the question that's on everybody's mind. And that is, did the vaccine play into any of your statistics? Uh, and if so, how so? Because we know that you, you would have to be ignoring what's going on today in the general public to see all the people that are just dying suddenly and have to wonder, did the vaccine have anything to do with that? Like, you have to at least be willing to ask the question. So let's do this. Let's take a last commercial break. Stay with us, folks. Never before has a product been so appropriately named as Botanic Tonics Feel Free. This plant-based elixir combines a variety of different effective compounds, all from raw plant materials that at different doses provide you with completely different experiences. A third of a bottle puts you in the zone and makes you very focused and is ideal for a non-stimulating pre-workout. It also has a mild analgesic effect for us older lifters who have soreness and little pains in aches that keep us from training as ferociously as we want. A half a bottle will create a mild euphoric effect that will allow you to forego consuming alcohol, but still be socially lubricated and have fun. I have never had a product deliver on its name the way Botanic Tonics Feel Free does, and I won't ever be without it, and you shouldn't either. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash feel free and use the code SHR40 for 40% off your first order. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. There are lots of concerns about food supply today. That's why you need White Oak Pastures. White Oak Pastures will deliver food right to your doorstep. You don't even have to go out and be disappointed by shopping in grocery stores. The finest beef, pork, lamb, duck, and more can be found at White Oak Pastures. And now they even have seafood. And best of all, White Oak Pastures has a negative carbon footprint, which means that you don't have to feel guilty for eating your ribeye. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash white oak and use the code superhuman to save 15% off. Dogs should be powered by fat and protein, not carbs. That's why Visionary Pet makes low-carb, ketogenic dog food for dogs of all breeds and life stages. From kibble to freeze-dried and even low-carb treats, all Visionary Pet recipes are very low-carb, ketogenic, and made with 100% real meat protein. Shop now and use code SHR for 20% off your first order today. Your dog deserves the lifelong benefits of optimal nutrition. Make the switch to Visionary and see why smart dogs eat low carb. You went off the wagon big time at the end of the year, meeting all those family obligations and eating and drinking things that you usually don't. In order to start the year off right, you have to get back to square one. All that partying and stress depletes magnesium. Magnesium Breakthrough is more effective than any other magnesium on the market today to help you get your magnesium levels back to where they need to be. That's because Magnesium Breakthrough has seven unique forms of magnesium. It's the new year, and if you want a new you, you need to replenish the magnesium in your body quickly. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash magbreakthrough and use the code SHR10 for 10% off today. You're listening to the Superhuman Channel. Don't hate us because we feel good. Welcome back. So, um, were any of these, uh, though, that were included um, recently vaccinated, or did these happen outside of when the vaccine was first introduced? Yeah, interestingly, uh, we, we didn't have the data to figure out, you know, if they were vaccinated or not. But interestingly, out of the six autopsies that we saw, actually, only one bodybuilder died in the in the era of the vaccine was even available. So 
Uh, most of them died actually 2017 uh, or before. So only one died in uh, 2021, which is right when all of this was going. Whether he was vaccinated or not, uh, you know, we we don't really know. Uh, but you know, these these deaths have been occurring for a while, even even pre-vaccine yeah. when we see it. So uh, you know, I I would say that maybe another potential covariate that may be contributing to it in some way, shape or form. But, but I think uh, there was a smoking gun there before anyway. And uh, again, we, I, one thing that I highlight all the time is there's definitely, we, we can't association does not mean causation. Uh, so right. when I'm saying that right. uh, all I'm saying is, you know, science is always a piece of the puzzle. So all this study was, there's another piece of the puzzle. We need to investigate things further. Uh, but at the same time, we also can't ignore the fact that we do have a lot of young individuals that are dying, that are using high dosages of anabolic steroids. And not only that, confounding with a lot of them are um, dying pretty close to contest time. Right. So we have to. This is why I think to me, the biggest red flag is, you know, the anabolic steroid use and abuse is one thing and the other anabolic compounds. But uh, the crazy peak week protocols with diuretic use and all of that's where I think we need to focus first because you add some of these pathologies that are occurring and then you compound that with these guru protocols that you're going to do last minute heroics to get shredded. Um, and then now you have a, you know, potential issues that are going to be in your hands. I've always said of all the sports and I want to call bodybuilding a sport for a moment because the actual competition is more pageantry than sport. And I've always argued that we should put compulsory lifts back into bodybuilding competition so it can be a sport bench press deadlift squat you know that's how it was back in the old days of york uh, it wasn't just about a pretty body it was about a functional body but with that being said bodybuilding is the hardest sport in the world bodybuilders train and work harder than pro football players pro basketball players i don't care who and i'll make this argument every day because Number one, in your offseason at the NFL, you go out and you do whatever you want. In the offseason of a bodybuilder, they're working harder. Then when the comp competitive season comes up, they're working harder. They work harder all year long. And their discipline for 10 years in a row to eat the same way, to sleep the same way. The drugs, you know, I mean, look. There was a period of my life where I was doing extremely high doses. And you know what? My ass hurt. My <laughs> shoulders hurt. Not from the training, from the injections. The skin doesn't even get a, a, a chance to heal the wound. And you got another three cc's going in. So that I don't think there's any more difficult, more. And I'm going to say noble. People go, how do you say, call it noble? It's a pageant. They drug. But you know what? what it takes, and and they make zero, zero. You never see anybody, oh, a bodybuilder was just signed for a $10 million contract. No, these people do it because they love it, and that's all. And they 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 do it for 10, 20 years at a time. It, 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 to me, bodybuilding is the most difficult sport in the world. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of components to it, as you said, you know, they're the, the quote-unquote off-season, that's really the the – the improvement season and, and uh, improvement season requires, you know, a lot of extra work and it doesn't mean you can, now you get to go out and party. It means you have to, you know, you need to be more dedicated. You need to make sure you you're, it's like groundhog day all the time, groundhog right. day all the time. Everything's on a schedule. Everything's on time and, you know, measuring your food, whether, whether you have to eat more of it or less of it, um, you know, training, being consistent, uh, everything, everything has to be monitored. It's very methodical. So it is, it is very, very challenging in that regard. So what's next? Uh, this was a, a fairly small sample size. And you even say that in the study, but where can we go from here? I remember there was a scientist I had on this show, probably in 2010 or 11, who had published a study and he called them APEDs. In other words, they were appearance and performance enhancing drugs. And he made the argument that bodybuilders, people who bodybuild like for competitive reasons is a slither of the actual population out there that's using anabolic steroids at any given time. He did this on the internet. 
people were anonymous. They talked about their use. And he said, really, 99 percent of the people using these drugs is for appearance, to appear like a bodybuilder, not compete at bodybuilding. So there's a much larger um, potential universe to review if you could tap into those people and go, OK, you're not a pro bodybuilder, but you died of a heart attack and you were using drugs and you were training like a bodybuilder. You're doing everything like a bodybuilder, just weren't competing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's that's a big uh, important point that you bring up is that uh, the 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 prevalence of anabolic steroid use in, in super physiological dosages is not particularly uh as prevalent in the athletic population, competitive population, it really is the general public. I think uh, uh, Rick Collins, who was a co-author with me on this study, he published a study back in 2006 or seven, uh, looking at the same thing. They sampled 1,900 plus, uh, you know, males and at, at regular gyms, and uh, you know, the the average user was a white male in his 30s, above right. average income, above uh, white, average white, education, white, white collar job, yeah. Right. Yep with a family and never doesn't want to compete with what's he want to do. He just wants to look, he just wants to look ripped. That's what he yeah. wants to do. And, and you know, and there's no shame in that. I mean, women go out and have butt implants and boob implants. They wear Spanx. They do things to look good. And we don't slight them because we like women who look good. And, but guys are like slammed, like, Oh, you know, you're so vain. No, I want to look a certain way. That's it. Why, yeah. why budget? And, and to that point, I think it's a population that does need to be studied. So uh, one, of, one of my next things is, uh, you know, I, I want to try to kind of bridge the gap better between the medical community and the bodybuilding community and these other, I'm going to call it, I'm going to call the bodybuilding community more general. It's not just pro bodybuilders or competitive bodybuilders. I'm going to say people that live, like you said, the bodybuilding lifestyle uh, that are maybe utilizing these uh, PEDs. Because I think we need they need to communicate better. Um, you know, the physicians shouldn't be judging and and the, the, the bodybuilding community shouldn't be scared of talking to physicians and having these honest conversations and, and then working together. Um, I think uh, having training physicians and identifying who that potential anabolic steroid user is. So, you know, typically someone that's more muscular probably has a BMI of obese or, or overweight, yeah, right, even, though, right. even though they're, they're not right. They're 10% right. body fat or whatever. Uh, you know, asking, prying in, asking some of those questions and then uh, hopefully developing a plan of care that is appropriate. So you can mitigate these risks and making sure that the physician is at least running appropriate tests. So, you know, it's going to be their job to educate you and talk to you about some of the potential, you know, uh, but they, they have to be educated first because I've had yes. my run-ins with physicians and I can tell you that they're highly judgmental when they, they look at you. If, if it was based on skin, they'd be racist. They look at us and they go, meathead. And that's really what they – and meanwhile, many of us are so serious about understanding and manipulating our physiology that we know more about certain parts of medicine than they do. But they look at us like we're just dumb. And th I think that comes from high school, the jocks, you know, the, and the geeks. And the doctors need to be trained not to be so put off by big muscular guys. We're not hurting anybody. We just want to look this way. We want to have that athleticism about us. And it, and it, it doesn't it's not a it's not a, a, a something about you. It's, it's about us. And yeah. now listen to what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, and I agree 100. percent You know, the the shaming uh, of of anybody, right? It, it, it's it's discriminatory. So, if, if this, it's a, it's like shaming somebody for being obese, and the and the doctor, it's their job to tell them, hey, look, it's dangerous to be obese, but don't shame them, and let, let's right. talk about interventions we can do. And it's the same thing with this population. We have to find a better way to do that. Uh, so that's kind of one of my things that I that I want to do. And I'm actually working with a couple of. Uh, I was on a podcast on with a couple of doctors, docs that lift, and uh, we were talking about, you know, working together on some of this. Uh, I'm also thinking uh, I'd like to eventually do more work on uh, users and non-users. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No I worries. On, yeah, on <laughs> users and non-users uh, and, and looking at things like ejection fraction, uh, body composition, and even looking at blood lipid profiles, uh, et cetera. Well, I'll tell you what else you need to start looking at. Uh, just in my humble opinion, I mean, I have no PhD or anything like that, but um, 
There's a doctor named Sean, and I can't think of his last name. He's been on my show. But he is really sounding the alarm about visceral fat. Visceral fat, I like to call it atomic fat because it's the fat that, like, causes problems. But we see a lot of bodybuilders with distended stomachs today. And no one is doing any kind of scans on them to determine is that distended stomach really a GH stomach? Everybody, all oh, the GH stomach, um, where where the intestines are uh, absorbing more glutamine and liquid, and they become, or is that fat? We need to look at that. This is a big deal, because back in the day, bodybuilders like Vince Gironda, they could do vacuum poses. They didn't eat the the amount of carbohydrates that they eat today. Like something is going on in bodybuilders. That's also going on in the general population. You walk into any Starbucks and you'll see 90% of those people have this barrel look to them. They couldn't do a vacuum pose if somebody says, I'm going to kill you if you don't do it. They couldn't get their stomach to be flat. <clears throat> These distended stomachs worry me, and we see them in the bodybuilding community too. Somebody needs to look into this. Is it the insulin? Is it the carbohydrate? Is it something else? But I really believe that these bodybuilders today, I remember seeing Gustavo Bedell. Puerto Rican bodybuilder, fantastic, really strong, good look, handsome. He couldn't keep his, he looked like he had a tortoise shell on his body. When he relaxed after posing, he relaxed. Boom, he looked like he was going to deliver a baby. What's going on with people and their guts? It's happening to the population. It's happening to bodybuilders too. Yeah, that would be interesting. And that's actually fairly easy to do. Actually, our, our DEXA machine here in our lab at the university is uh you know, you can actually look at visceral fat and you can you can quantify it, which is which is great. And you can actually see, you know, you can even see it as as they're progressing through their contest prep. Right. So you may be able to see what's their visceral fat when they when they or they're at their peak off season. Uh, and then what's their visceral fat, you know, when they're getting ready to compete, how much does it change? And uh, and you can actually see, you know, sometimes uh, that's even when you're ripped everywhere else, you may still have some visceral fat there. Um, and if you're carrying you know, two pounds of visceral fat doesn't sound like a lot, but it's, it's a small area. That's a, that's right. a lot. Of, that's a lot yes. of visceral fat to carry. Yes. And I'm going to send you, I'm going to make myself a note. I'm going to send you a link to the show that I did with this physician. He's brilliant. And what he connects the dots to what visceral fat actually does to us. You go to yourself, well, I want to go get my stomach scanned. I want to see if I have any visceral fat because this is going to shorten my life. So that, that would be fine. I'll send you the link to that show. You could reach out to him maybe and, and get him to participate with you. Yeah, that'd be that'd be great. Look, it's really great having you on the show. I hope you'll come back when you have something new to, to, to promote. You're always welcome back. Talk about the uh, associations you're affiliated with. Uh, you're going to be at the ISSN event in Florida. G give my audience a, a, a point. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this uh, June, we're going to be at the International Society of Sports Nutrition. Uh, it's a big uh, sports nutrition conference. And uh, I think the, some of the top sports nutritionists, uh, sports scientists in the world are going to be presenting some of their, their research there. Uh, so I will, I will be there uh, this upcoming uh, summer. Uh, I'll also be at the National Strength and Conditioning Association's National Conference in Las Vegas this year. That's going to take place in, in July. So that's the NSCA. Uh, I, um, I'm also a part of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. I'm, a, I'm on their scientific advisory board, and uh, I was actually the lead uh, expert on their subject matter expert on the bodybuilding and physique uh, coaching uh, program that we developed. So we actually put together, uh, there's 32 experts uh, ranging from bodybuilders, PhDs, and everything in between, coaches, uh, and we put together an A through Z in bodybuilding on a more evidence-based, safer approach to basically improving your physique and taking it to the next level. So we cover everything from anatomy, physiology, metabolism, uh, muscle hypertrophy, cardiovascular nutrition, uh, supplements, et cetera. So uh, check that program out. Um, if you want to get, get a discount code, you're welcome to shoot me a message there on uh, at Dr. G fit on IG um, or shoot me an email. Um, I'm here at California state university, San Bernardino. You can also find me here. Um, and, uh, uh, always willing to uh, help out. And the website is Dr. G fit. Dr. is spilled out D O C T O R G the letter G F I T.com. That's Hold right. And, and that's my exact same handle for IG as well. Yeah. At Dr. G fit. 
Thanks for being here today, Dr. Escalante. Thank Hope you so much for having me. Yeah, great. We'll do it again, I promise. And that's it for today. Uh, we had a completely uneventful broadcast today. Could you believe it? The camera didn't go down. Nothing broke midstream. So this is a good sign. And we'll see you tomorrow with more Superhuman Radio. Thanks for being here today. And please share the show. You never know who you're going to help when you share a show. See you soon.